I'm so happy to be here again today with Haris. He has come to give us an update on some of what he's been working on and maybe give us a clue as to what he's going to be moving into in the future. And I think if there's time, he might talk about an alternative method of calculating entropy that does not require a heat measurement. <laughs> and also a theory of morphogenesis that may, may include palindromes. So <laughs> I think we have some interesting things to discuss, but before we get to those latter two, um, Haris, maybe you could give us an update on your thinking. Are, are you still working on the monster theory? Did you come to a conclusion? Have you, has that jump started you in another direction? Yeah, basically uh, what I managed to do is that uh, I got in contact with a, a top tier uh, scientist. Uh, he's very well versed in both uh, uh, physics and mathematics. And uh, I presented my work and also uh, uh, these talks that we have together. And uh, he congratulated me and he told me that uh, I should rush and, and publish uh, very soon about it. So he told me that my proof is 100% correct. Uh, so that's... Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Uh, I told him uh, if he can suggest uh, an open journal because I want this to be published uh, so everyone can uh, have access to it and not put it behind a paywall. And uh, that was the main reason I conducted you, basically. Uh, and uh, he suggested a great journal of uh, arithmetic uh, sequences. Uh, it's the one that has to do with, uh, with my work because I'm basically I'm working with sequences in my proof. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was uh, very exciting news for me. And uh, when I uh, got that uh, feedback, let's say, uh, I straightforwardly started to uh, expanding it a bit uh, more. So uh, for, for those that uh, uh, caught up with the theory, uh, there is a link uh, between uh, the master group and, and twin primality. So uh, that's, the, that's my result, basically. So if we take that into consideration and giving some of the results that I've managed to, uh, to see through, let's say, uh, from this whole process is, uh, as we said the other time, there seems to be a spillover effect to other domains, uh, way beyond uh, group theory, uh, number theory, and, and primality. So it reaches out into uh, uh, physics, uh, quantum physics, and uh, many, many other fields. So, Which uh, doesn't surprise me at all, because all these, yeah. I mean, truth is scale invariant. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. And uh, there is also a very uh, nice notion because, you know, uh, I, I got myself into the, the, uh, the strange position of uh, trying to, I, I, I really don't want to uh, call this a theory of everything because I, I don't think it is. But I am I am uh, moving towards that direction slowly, slowly. So uh, I am also working on on the theoretical framework because uh, one theory, one such theory, let's say, it should also have uh, the so-called explanatory power, and, and also it needs to be attached with the whole theoretical framework. So I'm, I was working a bit uh, on that on that front uh, as well. And uh, there is a very nice notion uh, that uh, a good friend introduced to me that is called consilience. And uh, it is not a, a new notion, but it got, uh, uh, let's say, somewhat uh, recently introduced uh, into the West. And uh, it, it is all about this interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary research. So this is, as I understand it, it was the old way of doing science, the polymath uh, type of, of way. Uh, some of them call this the, the way of the enlightenment or the resonance uh, or all of that. Uh, I just see it as um, maybe this is, was the way of, of, the, of the ancients. Uh, I don't want to speak uh, specifically for uh, uh, Pythagoras, but my, my, I keep going back to him. So uh, it seems that uh, he got something right. And uh, not only with uh, the, those uh, platonic solids, uh, which are very uh, intriguing, let's say, uh, and, a, and a big part of my, of my own theory, particularly the octahedron, because at the end of the day, uh, 
the, because of my proof, I've managed to make this connection that is volumetric. So uh, imagine that it provides a new uh, way of, of understanding and different uh, uh, elements and different concepts in, in, in real world, let's say, in terms of, of, uh, of volume. And uh, by um, taking these, uh, uh, let's say, notions and the science and the uh, theor theories uh, together, uh, I realized that I couldn't uh, uh, keep back from uh, cognitive science because that's where my main background and my career is. So I, I took the, uh, the decision to, uh, to take two classes in uh, over at uh, Johannes Niederhauser uh, Halkion Academy. Uh, one of them was uh, with uh, Sean McFadden on, on uh, uh, technology, mm -hmm. uh, with the philosophy of the machine, basically. And uh, I, I even managed to present an article there that has to do with philosophy of science and uh, philosophy of mathematics. We can discuss a bit later on about that, too. Uh, and then I took another course uh, with uh, uh, John Vervecki. So, oh, yeah. Oh, wow, great. Yeah, that, that, that was a, a truly inspiring course. Uh, I realized that uh, John's content is great, but behind that, that, that uh, uh, let's say, uh, lecture hall, virtual lecture hall, he, he honestly puts uh, much extra effort in order to deliver greatness. Uh, he he gave us a, not only me but everyone participating we gain a lot from his uh, insights. So uh, I I got the chance to uh, present some uh, um, of my work also there uh, over at uh, Halkion Academy, and it had to do with uh, uh, once again it all ties up back to this theoretical framework. It had to do with what I call an extension to the fourth piece of, of John Vervecki. So uh, John Vervecki is calling about, uh, is talking about uh, uh, this uh, fourth piece of knowing, mm -hmm. the procedural, the propositional, and, and so forth. And uh, I, I managed to, uh, to make a suggestion, basically, that has to do with a tripartite uh, extension to it. So we have another uh, uh, three piece. Uh, and everything, if everything goes well, I will be able to publish that in a cognitive science, cognitive science journal too. So this is my progress so far. <laughs> You've been really busy. I knew you'd been busy because I've seen you pop up on other, um, other channels, particularly the Active Inference uh, channel where they're doing all these wonderful lectures by Chris Fields and others. And, uh, and you appeared there and presented some of your work and that was really exciting to see. Um, I had a thing to ask you about the consilience thing because when I first started thinking about all these things like five years ago or so, I had a picture in my mind of all these domains of knowledge intersecting. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I stumbled on the consilience idea and I bought a book that's called Consilience. Yes. And I started reading it, but. It was a little disappointing to me because the the theory kind of underpinning that book is that the reason there is consilience is that everything is built on top of everything else. It all starts out with physics and just it's all particles in the void. And then out of physics arises, you know, um, chemistry and then out of chemistry arises biology. And these things just all sort of arise and stack up on top of each other. And that's why there are connections between everything. But I think more in terms of the whole can be investigated in many different ways and all these different ways that we, we can investigate the whole would be physics and chemistry and biology. And so these are, are domains of knowledge that are particular perspectives on the whole rather than stacking up from the bottom up. So I don't know if that makes any sense to you. No, it makes sense because, uh, to be fair, I like the concept. I don't fully uh, agree with with uh, 
uh, with the way it got presented in that book. And that's the reason why I said that it's not a novel notion. It wasn't introduced by uh, that particular author. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very a very old notion as I understand it. And sometimes, as I as a, how to say it, uh, sometimes I call myself an outsider thinker. So I try to uh, differentiate myself. I, I take just uh, the things that I, I find that they are really useful. And even sometimes I modify them. So in my head, consilience has to do uh, with all this interdisciplinary perspective, with the seeking of uh, and making of uh, connections, uh, trying to go after coherence, let's say, across different fields of uh, uh, knowledge. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I can get I can get on board with that, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe we need a, a better word, let's say, but uh, this is the uh, the best one I managed to. Uh, to find a cross in terms of uh, uh, philosophy of, of science, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, um, because I, I don't like this, th this technical term of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, you know, it has this, uh, uh, this more technical uh, sense. Uh, I, I was going after something from the philosophy of science. So this is something that is a uh, work in progress, let's say, but I do agree with uh, what you are saying. I have noticed. Well, I uh, guess I guess the picture in my mind, what I'm thinking of, because I know this guy who's a, a mathematician, computer scientist, and a physicist, and but he loves mathematics so much, and he he says that he actually, when when he's contemplating a mathematical problem, he is. Gosh, the light is really strange in here. Um, when he's contemplating a mathematic problem. He is indwelling the world of mathematics. He he can walk around. He can see the mathematics out in front of him. I mean, that sounds a little strange, but I, I have a feeling that it's the same way for some people who are really um, like uh, fundamental theorists in physics, that they can they they have to be able to see the world of physics yeah. in their heads while they're thinking about it. And uh, I think chemistry is probably the same way. I know art is that way. And I can imagine that history is that way. So what that says to me is that each of those disciplines is actually a coherent whole that is coherent in itself, but it's like all these other things that, um, as Gödel said, no system is completely consistent and coherent within itself without some, out, out some higher principle, right? So. So, but a person can begin exploring that territory and never come to the end of it because, except the way we're doing it nowadays is we zero in more and more and more on some little thing and then learn more and more about it until we know everything about it. And then it's so small, it's almost worth, not even worth knowing about. Rather than looking out at this whole landscape and seeing how all the things fit together across all the landscapes which that's kind of where my brain goes. Actually, uh, this is my critique to modern academia. Um, apart from everything else, this is my critique like uh, targeted to the, uh, to the actual learning. Everyone now nowadays super specializes and they are going after their PhD thesis into something like making a, a tiny minute, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, progress in 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 a very extremely uh, narrow down field, but in fact, what we need is is a more general, more generalists in mm -hmm. this world. So people that they they do not necessarily uh, excel, let's say, in, in all of those fields, but they are something like a, a decathlon athlete. You know, it, it's a different uh, type of game. So. Uh, I'm not saying that we are not needing uh, uh, specialization. Of course, we do, and, but we also need to create uh, these generalists uh, out of the universities and even out of the research labs. Like getting different uh, specialists together to think of uh, something beyond their uh, domain, mm -hmm. something great. You know, uh, all innovations come out uh, uh, from that way. Uh, the problem is that. Uh, uh, most people, and I say that also for uh, mathematicians, they, they do not feel comfortable to go outside their domain. So uh, a number of theorists will not enter into the field of uh, 
um, um, group theory, for example, or, or something like that. So uh, it's interesting to keep an open mind and uh, go after this uh, exploration and creativity into learning and uh, into pedagogy as well. So, Well, I'm really excited to see what you do with, with your link between the monster group and twin primality and then somehow weave that into cognitive science. That's going to be very interesting. <laughs> so one of the um, groups of people that I enjoy listening to would be Michael Levin on his academic channel because he brings together people from a lot of different disciplines and has really fascinating conversations with them. Um, he's had conversations with Mark Solms, who is a neuro neuroscientist and with... Um, Ian McGilchrist, who, of course, is very cross-disciplinary in his thinking, and with um, Chris, Fields. Chris Fields, who's a physicist and computer scientist and um, philosopher of sorts, who really thinks about alternative sciences, and, um, and also Richard Watson, who is an absolute fascinating thinker. So, so he's been trying to learn from a lot of different disciplines. Um, as he kind of explores his own area. And one of his thoughts is this idea of uh, morpho space, that there has to exist some sort of a, a space in which organisms develop their different parts. So when the arms are growing, how do they know how long to grow and how do they both stop at the same time so that they're the same size? and and how did they know how to get the fingers right and all that? And he posits that there's some sort of morpho space so that these organisms are working something that he calls morphogenesis inside this morpho space. And I was contemplating that question and you said you thought it might have something to do with palindromes. And yeah. so I'm really, and does that idea of palindromes tie into what you said earlier about recollection and habit? Yeah, and also uh, the notion of memory and even the notion of recency. Recency. So, yes. Okay. Uh, so it's like uh, not only what happened in the far uh, past, but also what happened like just before, you know, uh, moments ago. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, polydromes, they have this um, beautiful symmetry uh, and you can cut them in half. And I, I intentionally make the move just to uh, make an analogy with uh, the work of uh, Michael Levin uh, that he's doing with the uh, with the worms mm -hmm. uh, that he's cutting into half in order to regrow. So uh, this is how I see it: uh, um, cutting down uh, strings of numbers or letters. Uh, has no ethical implications to put it like that. So in terms of uh, uh, I'm going to be using a, a technical term, uh, quasi-experimentation, which is experimentation that is based on uh, numerical analysis and simulations. So uh, you actually, instead of uh, doing experimentation on, on uh, living systems, you can do it with uh, something that is uh, uh, an non-living uh, system, like a system of numbers or a system of strings, and this all ties back to the work of Turing, which his last paper was very similar on the work of Michael Levin and Morpho uh, space. Uh, it had Seriously? To do with, yes, he, uh, no, not uh, many people remember that because they used to put it, uh, that particular paper uh, under the, how do you say, under the carpet, let's say, uh, and focus on his work on, on uh, the Turing machines and all of that, but yes, can, can we last... get a link to that paper? Of course, I will send oh, it okay. to you. Okay, yeah. of course, of course. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, uh, something that I uh, I can see uh, as a uh, as a parallel, and and I really believe that Michael Levin is making a, a continuation of that work, and not only I can even because I'm also into the history of science. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, topics, let's say. Uh, he even, I can even make a link with someone, another scientist even before him, which was uh, uh, Luigi Calvani, 
uh, the guy that made uh, the experiments with electricity, bioelectricity and frog legs. Uh, and it is where we got the, the word uh, galvanization. Uh, oh. Let's say it got galvanized into action. Uh -huh. So uh, how I understand it in terms of uh, uh, computer science or information science, let's say, when a system uh, reaches the minimum activation level, requirements, it gets galvanized. So uh, this is uh, what what uh, Michael Levin is doing as, as far as I, I can tell. I can tell. Um, by cutting, let's say, this paramecium uh, into a particular way, it, it, it uh, uh, pushes the, the, orca, the living organism to, to explore the morphospace in 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 a in a form of atavism, I don't know how to say it, but it has to do with some form of this what I call palindromic knowing. So uh, this goes back to the uh, unconventional cognition and that part of his work as well. And also, well, so uh, let's explore this palindromic knowing a little bit and and leave aside Michael Levin's stuff right now. Let's just try to explore it cross-disciplinarily, okay? Yes, um, yes. If there is a kind of palindromic knowing, uh -huh. um, it, it sounds almost as, it sounds similar to like David Bohm's idea of the the enfolding and the unfolding. Uh -huh. So a, a palindrome, 9876789, let's say, okay? 9876, <laughs> Seven, eight, nine. It's going back out into the into the the memory field, but it's unfolding it as a mirror. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Exactly. And the same thing goes with uh, uh, because one of the things I I constantly uh, I say to uh, to other friends uh, when we're discussing uh, uh, science, let's say is that th there is uh, uh, this form of uh, palindrome that uh, has to do with uh, uh, arithmetic and numbers, as you said, 987, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, or uh, this is an odd one. Uh, maybe there is also an even one, like 9, 8, 7, 6, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, this has to do with the natural language of numbers of, of integers. Uh, also, it can uh, uh, appear with uh, other uh, natural languages like the English uh, language or the Greek language uh, and all of that. So a, a word like the word uh, civic uh, actually falls into that very same category. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, th this notion of, of uh, uh, symmetry, let's say, uh, it's a very interesting one, and we can, of course, uh, uh, take it a step further and and even take it into this field of biology. And like when when the when the organism or the or the, or the process, let's say that the underlying process uh, acknowledges that it reaches the half point, then it just at fault, as you said before. So it's a process a process of are unraveling, let's say. Uh, this is how I, I personally understand uh, this. Uh, interestingly, there is a one uh, in, in, in a fountain in outside of uh, um, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a fountain with a very well-known palindrome. Uh, that reads uh, an inscription in Greek. It's a very long one. Uh, let me see if I, if I can find it. I know it. So it's well, called... I think it was part of the the um, the Greek literary, mm -hmm. well, and also Hebrew literary uh, tradition, wasn't it, to build chiasm, chiastic structure into the writings, which is very much like a palindrome. Yes, um, yes. And not it's an it's an non-identical repetition in the palindrome. 
it's one form of a of a palindrome yes yeah uh, so that one was uh, in the greek language it it read nipsona nomimata mimona mimonan opsi and it translates into wash my transgressions not only my face so uh, it was uh, wash my wash my tra tra transgressions not oh, only my, my face Oh, wonderful, yes. wonderful, that's wonderful. It was inscribed upon the holy water uh, font near the entrance of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. So uh, going back to uh, palindromes and lexical ones, it's not only uh, single word ones, but we can also get some uh, uh, short phrases like in that example, uh, in the Greek. In the English language, we have Madam, I am Madam. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, now, uh, allow me just to give uh, a short introduction into these uh, uh, types of knowing. Like, uh, I will, uh, will briefly go through them. Uh, oh, the, the, this is your extension of the four P's. Yeah. Do you want me to go through uh, and John's? Uh, for well, at four? least mention at least mention the four P's for people who might not have heard of it before. Okay, I, I will mention it and, and explain it uh, uh, briefly, let's say, uh, each. So uh, the first one, of course, is participatory knowing. And this is knowing how to act in the Asian arena environment, uh, which basically is the dynamic and interactive relationship between the agent, that is the self, oneself, and the arena that is uh, uh, the world. Um, the second type is uh, what John calls perspectival knowing and this is knowing that uh, this is knowing what it's like to be in a particular type of situation or into a particular state of mind uh, which is the subjective and the experiential aspect of cognition uh, the third type uh, of the fourth piece of uh, john is uh, called procedural knowing and this is knowing how to do something uh, which is the practical and instrumental aspect of cognition or the operational, let's say, aspect of it. And lastly, we have the pro propositional knowing that is knowing that something is true, uh, which is the factual and the descrip descriptive aspect of cognition. So John uh, posits these four types of knowing and I propose a, a tripartite extension to it uh, that consists of another three pieces. Uh, so uh, briefly, uh, the first one is what I call uh, perspicacious knowing. And this is knowing with deep insight, uh, sagacity and practical wisdom, which is the ability to notice, understand, or judge things accurately and quickly, especially things that they are not so obvious or clear. Uh, so for example, solving a, a, a puzzle, let's say that you have never encountered before. Uh, there is some uh, sort of type of knowing that uh, I, I believe that is, it can be captured with this type of knowing, uh, perspicacious knowing. So uh, the other one, the next one is what I call perfusive knowing. This is knowing that involves uh, an overflowing an almost swarming type of collective and not necessarily individual knowing, which basically is the phenomenon of collective intelligence or the so-called phenomenon, phenomenon of the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, where a group of people can perform better than an individual on certain tasks. So uh, one example is uh, to understand this is, is the way that stand-up comedians, they actually uh, uh, test their jokes and their different routines. They go in front of a, a crowd, they perform a new joke, and uh, according to the feedback and the, uh, the lavometer, let's say, uh, they decide to keep it or not into their uh, routine. 
So uh, that's the perfusive, uh, perfusive knowing. And the, the last one is what I call palindromic knowing. Uh, this is knowing with an almost historical uh, literacy or even, or even numeracy type of knowing, as we discussed before, such as the knowing that arises out of uh, reversibility. So those uh, examples that we've discussed, it can be found in historical inscriptions uh, and it can be found in, in, in language uh, and, and in a way it exposes one to the to both the symmetry and to the beauty of, of, uh, of language, of logic, through careful observation, utterance, and articulation. So it has to do with uh, uh, this uh, uh, type of, of, of uh, knowing that in, in a way, I believe that I am trying to, to reclaim it. I think that it was well known in the past and people forgot about it. And in a way, just to put it in, out there as an a, a extension uh, to John's uh, uh, a fourth piece of knowing, I am hoping to reclaim that uh, lost type of, of knowing. So I have some questions about that, but I'm going to pause the recording for just a second so I can adjust my blinds because I'm sitting here in this very strange light. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Okay, so so regarding um, the perfusive, is that P-E-R-F-U-S-I-V-E? Okay. That's a word I've never heard. Very interesting. Did you make that word up or is it an actual? It's an actual word. I know that it's a bit rare, uh, but you know how I actually came up with it? Uh, I was listening to the incident that took place, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in... Uh, Hawaii, that had to do with a with a false warning uh, of uh, um, of uh, of a strike, and uh, where in in that case, uh, everyone basically they got uh, they heard the sirens, they read the different uh, uh, let's say signals uh, that were went out there. So this is the type of uh, of knowing that I call perfusive. It's something that comes out to you and not only to you personally, but maybe to the whole uh, group or, or even to the whole uh, uh, country or even to the whole civilization. So uh, it has to do with uh, uh, this swarming type of, of knowing. It's not something that uh, you need to, not only to experience it, to understand it, uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint it down but I, I am hoping that I am putting it in, in, in good uh, uh, context here. So please, if you have any other uh, Yeah, I, I have a lot of questions about it because it seems to me that that one particularly can go either way. Like, yes, a comedian can check out his jokes and see whether or not they're, they're jokes that would be um, appreciated by the crowd. But Hitler could also try out his ideas on the crowd and... Uh, and and change um yeah. adapt himself more and more to the energy that he felt in the crowd so the wisdom of crowds can be a mob or it can be um a collective wisdom that actually helps yeah, one as another. You, yeah as, as you uh, describe it in that way it reminds me of a double-edged uh, sword as yeah. they as they say uh-huh yeah it kind of uh, both uh, ways that's so, yeah, that maybe you know, that may be true of all the kinds of knowing i mean i can i can see that aspect on on a lot of them and then on the palindromic knowing i wanted to ask you would would the kinds of things that we learn by tradition from our mother's apron strings growing up would that also be part of that like the, yeah. the kind of you know, like, my, like some of the things my mother taught me when I was growing up that, I mean, I just remember they're just a part of the environment I was in are actually, and she had no college education. She had no background in science or anything like that, but she under, she had some ideas about what, what, what made a nutritious meal, for example. And 
she was way more correct than what science has been telling us for a long time, because those were traditions that had been handed down for generations and people knew what they needed to eat in order to stay alive. <laughs> so yes. it, it, does it include that kind of knowing? Yes. And uh, one, one uh, uh, example, let's say, it will be, of course, uh, recipes uh, that they get handed down in terms of, uh, uh, it has to do with, uh, I don't know how they call it. It's uh, It has to do with, uh, Proxonomy. I don't know the quite uh, exact word in, in English, but it has to do with this, uh, um, both the uh, local tradition, but also the domestic ones. So uh, it, it is knowledge that gets passed uh, from the individual in a, and in a way it's like passing the torch in, in the, uh, you know, in, the, in, in that uh, Olympi Olympic. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Hug and feel, yeah. Yeah. So uh, recipes will be definitely be one. The other will be maybe even some uh, uh, catchphrases that they uh, get passed on, uh, or even some uh, um, uh, adages, as they call it, uh, and uh, even some norms. Like, this is how we do things here. So uh -huh. it gets uh, it gets passed on, let's say, in that way, and uh, of course uh, <clears throat> now just to try to to capture that aspect, that dual aspect uh, that you said before in terms of a perfusive uh, knowing, and you extended it correctly to all the types of knowing because knowledge can be powerful, and in 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 and that goes both ways. Uh, maybe, uh, just maybe, it's uh, it also has to do with um, uh, how do you, to to put it into words. Um, anyway, I lost my train. Uh, my train well, of thought there. So when you were talking, what jumped yeah. into my mind is the way that Jordan Peterson always talks about things that that it's that kind of knowing that if we destroy that kind of knowing, we're doing that at our deep peril because in essence, it's that kind of archetypal knowing that, that comes to us from the very beginning of time. And I can totally see that as a type of palindromic knowing because um, this, this wisdom comes to earth to um to fill us and prepare us to rise up and and be reunited with god and so it's a coming down and a going back up again and so it is folded in down into this this mm -hmm. place and then it needs to unfold in order to prepare us for this um for i guess what in the orthodox tradition they call theosis um the, yes. but, but being united with God and uh, yeah, I, I can totally see that. And and that's really not captured in any of John's four P's. Yeah, I, I tried uh, my best to, uh, uh, to really uh, capture this because uh, as I said before, I, I really think I agree with what you said that uh, Jordan Peterson mentions that these things are getting lost, and this, for sure, it's an effort to to reclaim that and to. It's not only for remembrance; is is uh, for the good of everyone. I think. Uh huh. So, yeah. uh, when you mentioned before, just a small comment. You mentioned uh, uh, theosis, uh, the tradition. There is also the. Uh, I would like to make a small uh, brief reference to uh, the monastic tradition within East Eastern Orthodoxy mm -hmm. uh, that is called Isihasm. And uh, the the aim of Isihasm is theosis. So uh -huh. Isihasm is to uh, uh, keep silent <laughs> and to pray. And it is also where... Uh, the the tradition of of the of the silent uh, Jesus prayer comes. Mm -hmm. 
That was right. what jumped in my mind when you said hesychasm was the yeah. Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. Son of God. Um, Have mercy on me, this evening. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the uh, the keeping silent and praying that brings another kind of knowing. Or, or does that fit in with one of these three kinds of knowing? Well, first of all, uh, contemplation. Uh, it's completely different from the uh, meditation practice. Okay, mm -hmm. so it has nothing to do. The, when we uh, say contemplation, we actually refer to that type of internal prayer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess if, he, if it's going to be uh, captured somewhere, it will be within uh, the, the, this historic tradition of, of the repetition of the, of the prayer. So for me, it falls under palindromic knowing uh, once more. So it keeps, it keeps getting repeated for a good reason. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it as a, the whole prayer getting repeated for again and again. There, there were some uh, saints that they were, uh, and daily they were uh, repeating it like uh, thousands of times. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they, they were doing it out loud. Uh, some other times they were doing it uh, uh, eternally. But the whole aim, uh, and especially you understand this if you, uh, w w when you visit, like in my case, when I visited uh, Mount Athos, uh, I understood that at the, you start by uh, verbalizing the prayer and then it becomes eternalized and mm -hmm. then it, it just happens, it opens on the background. So it, uh, you might be uh, uh, talking, but you are still praying inside. So it's like a, a, a software routine that uh, gets uh, uh, installed. So. It's very interesting. Well, it, it, that... devel it develops a perspective, doesn't it? I mean, because, because it tells a whole story, mm -hmm. right? Lord Jesus Christ tells you that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, Christ tells you that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that came. And, and Jesus tells you that he saves. So Lord Jesus Christ tells you all that already. And then have mercy on me. I need mercy because I'm a sinner, but it also tells you that God is merciful and that he's willing to have mercy and that the way he shows us his mercy is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, I mean, it tells you this whole story. And, and then if you, if you dwell with that reality that without him, I am nothing. And, and without him, I am lost in my sin and I am a sinner and I need mercy then that changes the way that you interact with everybody and every idea. So once that's internalized, that that begins its work of transformation in us, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I agree with you 100%. It is a compressed form uh, that tells, uh, uh, that speaks in volumes, to put mm -hmm. it in terms. And, and also because it is the individual that, chooses to do it, it also, for me, at least this is my personal view, it exemplifies the notion of free will, uh, which I know is a very hot topic in, in the science uh, world, but uh, since we are talking about theology, I have to bring it up. Uh, uh, in, in my case, uh, my, my science gets uh, educated by my, my theology. So, I, I don't see it as something different. Uh, I see it's something that I am gaining strength from my theology, from my faith uh, in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to perform my exploration in whatever you, I do. Maybe I'm uh, researching on, on something. Maybe I'm cleaning the, the dishes or, or my room, as uh, Jordan Peterson said. So, yeah. Uh, so that that's that's um, that whole thing about free will. I had a friend ask me the other day. She said, 
she said, one of my students came to me and asked me if I believed in free will. And I said, well, of course. <laughs> and the student said, well, you know, this Robert Sapolsky just came out with a new book proving that free will doesn't exist. And so my friend was saying to me, how, how could somebody write a book like that? I mean, what's yeah. their point? Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, how, if you don't believe in free will, where do you get the freedom to write the book? I mean, that's, you know, yeah. you have to choose to write the book, right? You have to choose to have the ideas. So um, yeah. I guess it was inevitable that Robert Sapolsky would write a book about free will not existing. You know, for me, this is, uh, they, are, they are trying to make a comeback. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh ongoing discourse at the moment, and not only in terms of uh, atheism versus faith, but also uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the atheists, they go after the panpsychists uh, these days. So very recently, uh, a list of, uh, uh, I don't know how many there were, there were a, a lot of them. Many researchers, they, they signed uh, an open letter against uh, Integrated information theory, uh, and and how I I personally interpret it is that the atheists are going after the panpsychist <laughs> scientists. <laughs> so uh, for me, it, it was uh, uh, one of those moves that they were uh, uh, below the the belt, let's say. So yeah. Well, so is is integrated information theory fundamentally panpsychist? Uh, this is my personal opinion. It it has some aspects of it. Yes, it has some aspect. Personally, I don't. I I, I can. I, I like the fact that uh, they are trying to uh, capture, let's say, the senses of consciousness with this five number that they have. Uh, but I like the way before this open letter came that. Uh, uh, called it, called it uh, pseudoscience. Uh, this is why I I believe it was a, a, a strike below the belt. Way before that, there was a, a computer scientist, and Anderson, if I'm not mistaken, that he published uh, uh, his uh, on his blog his critique against it. And one of the of his, it's a very nice critique. It is coming from the information uh, science perspective. And it was like, but I can I can create a circuit with uh, thousands of uh, simple gates that will uh, have a, a fine number that is higher than anything you uh, consider uh, uh, conscious. Uh, and in that way, but I know that it is not a conscious uh, being because I created it from uh, small circuit gates. And the response of the of the of, of the scientists that developed and initially proposed that theory, uh, it was like, uh, um, as Anderson said, uh, he bought the bullet, and uh, uh, he went all in. He said, "Yes, then it is also conscious. If it has a, a very big uh, phi uh, number, then that circuit board indeed is conscious." So this is my my. Uh, uh, let's say perspective on it, mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, now I'm trying to not not justify uh, that group that uh, signed that letter. I just wanted to say that from all those uh, scientists that signed the letter, one of them was Daniel Dennett, uh, that I I truly appreciate because he created things. Uh, uh, he came up with uh, the notion of intuition pumps. Uh, uh, he came uh, up with very, very nice notions. So uh, I don't understand why they uh, they they decided to attack uh, that particular theory now. Uh, but yes, uh, this is an interesting type of discourse that is going on currently in academia. And uh, I wanted to, to mention it. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes there um, that the whole idea of panpsychism is 
a way of trying to find a way of of scientifically recognizing some of the patterns that we see in the universe but without acknowledging that there's god that had anything to do with those patterns yeah is that right does that sound right i think you you can you can you can posit it in in that uh, fashion let's say uh, as i understand it the, the main claim is that uh, everything is consciousness so uh, from a uh, a water molecule uh, up to the conscious being, let's say, or to alien beings or to planets or uh, whatever, or, or even the universe at large, everything is imbued with this consciousness. So th that's the that's the claim they are making. Oh, okay, so so now I want I want you to be my uh, my devil's advocate. So if, that, if that's if that's their claim, then. What does that claim really mean? Does that mean that the universe is God or that there there is a consciousness outside the universe that imbued the universe with consciousness so that everything is conscious to reflect that God or that there is no God and that everything started with particles in the void but developed consciousness at the very beginning and then now consciousness exists everywhere in the universe? Or I mean, what what does it really mean when they say those things? I think they they because now we are still talking about scientists here. Mm -hmm. They are, they are uh, going after the the what Einstein said. I believe in in Spinoza's God. So this is uh, what they are they are uh, saying. Well, so I've that, heard that before. So tell me, what is Spinoza's God? <laughs> the universe is is one. So the, 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 we are all connected, interconnected, and basically the whole universe is one, one consciousness. This is the basic claim. As far as I understand it, uh, in, in terms of theology, we, we believe that uh, God the creator was outside of the universe. So he created the universe and then sent, uh, uh, let's say, the, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ to visit us. Uh, and the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, he was with him from the beginning, the very beginning. Mm -hmm. That's why they call him the Ancient of Days and God the right. Father. Yeah. And, and the spirit that comes forth, the Paracletos, also it's, it's, the, it's the messenger. This is why uh, they signified it in terms of symbolism. Shout out to Jonathan Pajot uh, with, uh, with the white dove. So uh, this is how I understand our main difference, let's say. Uh, it's one thing to uh, abide by this uh, uh, panpsychist view, and it's a different thing to abide by the, the Eastern Orthodox or the Orthodox uh, uh, Christian view. There are two different, different things that Maybe well, so, they, so what would what what would the Orthodox Christian view think of there being consciousness in particles or in cells? Okay, I I don't think they will agree uh, with that. Of course, we have uh, we are uh, feeling free enough to use uh, uh, phrases like even the rocks will cry out loud. You know, so uh, we have this uh, uh, the imagination, let's say, to to make the metaphorical links, mm -hmm. but we do not believe that everything is is consciousness. Of course, we believe that animals are conscious, like my cats are conscious beings, and uh, many other uh, animals. Uh, of course, you don't know at what level you go down, uh, and this is goes into the. Uh, the whole uh, debate about the hierarchy of levels and uh, let's say uh, where will you place uh, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics and, and, and all of that. So uh, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, way to think of it. Well, so how do you differentiate cogn cognition and consciousness? Well, uh, cognition implies uh, a conscious agent. 
So uh, that's one thing. Uh, well, because well, okay. So are you are you differentiating cognition and intelligence, or are you thinking of them as the same thing? Okay. Uh, because I, you know, I, even you know how Michael Levin always talks about his um, theory of mind everywhere. Um, that even cells are capable of some sort of cognitive processing. Yeah, maybe, but is maybe. that different than consciousness? Yes. And and I think the best way to, to answer it is, is to, to make a comparison between my, my 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 theory and my personal views, let's say, and my personal scientific uh, and theoretical framework with the, with that of uh, Donald Hoffman. Okay. Uh, with Donald Hoffman, uh, I can summarize his uh, he, his uh, uh, the theory of conscious agents in 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 three ways. Uh, the, in the first point, I completely agree with him. Uh, space, but I'm not calling it as harshly as he does. Uh, he usually says that space time is doomed. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, what? But I agree with him that uh, space and time are both uh, emergent properties uh, of the universe. They are not fundamental, but rather emerging properties. So uh, this is my point uh, that I agree with him. His, his second point, I slightly disagree there. He's saying, I am making a distinction now that is, I think it's, it's gonna be really helpful to the overall conversation. Uh, Donald Hoffman suggests that we are living in a, inside a simulation. Okay, I believe mm -hmm. I don't I don't abide by that. I believe we live inside an emulation. So what he calls a, a, a simul the the universe he calls the universe a simulator. I call it an emulator. So there is a very fine distinction there. We can get into uh, that distinction in a bit. Uh, or in, a, in another, let's say, talk. Uh, but that's the second point uh, that summarizes both his views and mine and the slight differences. Uh, and the third point, uh, it, it has to do with, uh, uh, with consciousness. Um, he believes that uh, consciousness is fundamental and therefore conscious agents exist. I believe that conscious computation is fundamental. So again, once again, there is this slight uh, difference, but my, 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 in, in my framework, let's say, is supported by my theology. So in, in my framework, uh, the creator God, the father, he made a conscious thought that was, as we, we will parse it now, it was a conscious computation, and he created everything like, like that. Everything, everything, like the universe as we know it. So, Okay, uh, so now let's dig down into that word computation, because mm -hmm. a lot of people resist that word because they think it is machine-like. I'm sure if we were having this conversation and you use that word with Ian McGilchrist, he would start prickling a little bit because he would think that you're uh, <clears throat> accusing the universe of being machine-like. But I mean, no. you know how I think about it. I think differently about computation as does Glenn and all the conversations we've had, but I'm interested in what is your um, definition or perspective on computation? Yeah. Uh... Computation can be understood in, in, in the proper sense that we all understand it, like making uh, arithmetic, uh, 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 let's say, uh, manipulations of, of strings of numbers and all of that. And it can also be understood in, in, a, in a deeper, let's say, level in what, I'm going into Michael Levin's work uh, once more. So uh, I, I gave you uh, in one of our emails, and I think we briefly mentioned this here, the case of 
the, the, the red deer shedding and regrowing their rattlers. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a type of conscious computation. You can if if that if that uh, uh, how do you say? It it is a type of computation. Let's uh, leave the conscious uh, part out of it. Uh, it is a biological computation that that repeats, and there is a whole cycle. Let's say that goes on. And it obeys laws of uh, symmetry and, and aesthetics and beauties because the two uh, sides of the, those handlers, they are uh, almost uh, completely symmetrical. And uh, from generation to generation, they, they pretty much keep the same shape. Maybe they evolve a bit due to uh, uh, environmental, let's say, constraints and conditions and factors because biological systems, they are uh, open systems. They are living organisms, so they undergo this dynamical uh, progress. So in, in, in that sense, and getting a little bit more technical, I also consider that as a type of biological computation. So, you can do computation, you can understand it also in terms of performing computation with quantum dots, for example. So, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or uh, recently a, a good internet friend from uh, uh, the Discord server that I um, uh, particularly uh, enjoy sp spending time there, which is, you uh, know, uh, Grim. So it's the broken clock tower. So shout, shout out to everyone there. I have a good uh, friend from there uh, called Neutrino. And uh, we discuss a lot of these uh, uh, issues together, uh, especially about science and, uh, and also theology. And uh, one of the, of the things that uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, discussed had to do with uh, uh, with with everything that uh, more or less we're discussing uh, here now, like uh, going back from uh, the the discussion about the integrated uh, uh, theory, all the way to uh, uh, what we are uh, talking about now in terms of uh, uh, consciousness and and computation. So, uh, Nutrino shared to me. Uh, the, uh, two two videos that he found on Twitter from the celebration for the Halloween in two countries. I think it was uh, in Japan and, and another uh, country in the Far East. And it was, uh, the first one was a giant skeleton and the other one was a, a, a dragon. And it was composed by uh, swarms of drones. So it, it was too uh, great, let's say, uh, uh, figures in, in the sky and they were actually in the night sky. So they were, uh, how do you say, they were actually performing this uh, uh, routine and they were doing it in this swarm type uh, way. Of course, an engineer sat down or many engineers and, and, and coded that, uh, how it's gonna actually work. So there is, there is computation behind such things. So uh, recently, another uh, uh, thought that I shared in that uh, discourse server was like structure defines function and function uh, characterizes structure. So uh, this is, uh, uh, they are into uh, reciprocal, let's say, uh, relationship. Uh, those two. So this is very exciting. So this morning when I was walking, I was trying to think of through a way to explain to you this theory that's been percolating in my head for about five years. Well, actually, it's been percolating in my head for 20 years. But in the last five years, as I've been talking to people on my channel, I've been trying to find a way to put it into words. And I should have written it down. <laughs> because I, I said it over to myself about three times while I was walking, but now it's sort of evaporating again because it's very difficult to put into words. But 
it's partly that I, I believe that there is a set of principles that um, that establish a kind of a matrix or a scaffold that underlies all the laws of physics. And so it's, <clears throat> I don't know that it's fundamental, but it arises out of that which is fundamental. And it, it begins with a set of principles. The universe, in other words, the universe doesn't begin with gravity the way that Stephen Hawking said, or the way that um, a lot of scientists say that the laws of physics underlie everything in the universe. I believe that there is a set of principles underlying those physical laws. And that that set of principles creates this scaffold or matrix um, in order to provide infinite flexibility and adaptivity for the purpose of producing beauty, truth, and goodness. And that that scaffolding of principles, it, it produces a scaffold because it's an interweaving of all of these principles um, proportionally intersecting all of these principles. And the best way I can describe it would be to say, <clears throat> imagine that the universe is a work of art and, and it's a painting and um, a stroke of paint is about to go down in a particular place on the canvas because there's already, the, the painting is already underway and this stroke of paint is going to bring unity and beauty into the painting in a unique way that only that stroke of paint can do. And that stroke of paint is also, the, the, the artist is also considering, well, what about the balance? What about the proportion? What about the rhythm? What about the, uh, the gradation? What about the uh, repetition, the necessary repetition? What about um, variation? Is there harmony? All of these things have to be considered as each stroke goes down. And so you can imagine all these things intersecting in a way that that stroke produces the perfect amount of balance and the perfect amount of gradation and the perfect amount of color or texture or direction or whatever in that particular place in the universe. So so, so it, it's this highly... I like looking at the pictures that Wolfram draws of, of all these hypergraphs because it kind of is that picture in my mind of how these things all intersect with each other. But, but it's a, I don't know if it's a conceptual framework, these principles that are underneath the laws of physics, or if it is, if these principles actually drive the laws of physics, drive that which is responding to the laws of physics to fall into certain places or to relax into certain configurations according to these principles that bring forth beauty, truth, and goodness. Does that make any sense? A lot of sense, and thank you for sharing. I honestly like uh, uh, your theory um, that combines uh, art. I told you so during our previous talks. And uh, just a small, a small intro here, a small comment. I really like Wolfram's computational physics. Yeah. So he, his mindset is very well aligned with mine in that aspect. Uh, of course, he goes on and, and he has this uh, Rouliat and the hyper Rouliat. And yes, all this, and an infinite regression. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in my, and, and that's the critique they are doing to him, and, and not only Ian McGillicris, but also uh, the others. Uh, now, uh, I will try to uh, uh, shift that a bit and uh, try to capture a different example that also uh, is well aligned with your model. Uh, in, in Your model covers seven different uh, uh, principles, if I am not mistaken, right? It's texture. Well, there's, and, there's seven elements, which yeah. I believe are are all the parts that kind of make up the universe or make up any work of, of art. 
and then the the eight principles. But it doesn't have to just be those eight principles. Those happen to be the eight principles that I'm familiar with. But um, mm -hmm. yesterday I had a long conversation about Romano Guardini's um, theory of opposites. And Guardini has um, eight oppositions or tensions that align pretty well with uh, the eight principles that I'm thinking of, but but expands on it a little bit. So I think you could also incorporate some of Guardini's ideas, but Guardini's ideas are more at the social scale. But I do think all these things scale. If if you yeah. run if you run it if you run upon one of these principles that scales, <clears throat> that scale invariant, I guess I would say. And 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 the, so the principles that I'm naming are pretty much scale invariant across every discipline that I've been able to talk to in the last five years. So physics and chemistry and biology and um, piano and um, mm -hmm. composition and art and photography and anybody that I've been able to talk to in any of those fields, at least those eight principles are scale invariant. For me, your these. Uh... Seven plus eight, the fifteen. They are adequate to uh, to describe the whole thing. So everything that uh, that you want. Uh, this is like a, a maybe it's even the minimal number, but but I am not a one hundred percent. It's just a matter of intuition. Anyway, to go back to the to this contrast from uh, the complexity of the hyperroliat into the simplicity, okay? Imagine just choosing one, particularly let's focus on color, okay? Mm -hmm. Then into my mind, uh, I have a Yves Klein with his monochrome international clay blue and that uh, painting uh, series where he only uh, created these uh, paintings with blue. So he hyper-focused on one, and only the 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 the, the fine uh, uh, coloring, let's say, of that color, and he even went and patented it, it uh, that particular one. So uh, he believed that he found the the perfect uh, uh, color. Uh, so not only the the blue, but the actual hue uh, that goes uh, uh, in in terms of that color. So who and is that? Who is that artist? Yves Klein, Yves Klein. I can send you uh, some, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, some links from his work. Uh, when I visited uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, the museum there, I got the chance to look up close and indeed it's spectacular. Like I couldn't believe that uh, you, you can actually witness uh, a painting, a monochrome, and you can be so uh, captivated by it. But indeed he, he, he was he put a lot of effort into describing what he called uh, the ultimate si uh, simplicity, let's say, or unity in, mm -hmm. in his. Sense. So uh, it was a very interesting take at the time because he 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 pioneered that nobody dared to create a, a canvas only with uh, a single color, but his main. Uh, thinking and his niche, let's say, was like, but I, I will come up with the with the perfect hue. So he focused on, on that uh, particular aspect, let's say. So uh, I agree with this scaffolding. Now I'm going a bit back with the scaffolding of of principles and uh, concepts and, and the, this uh, gradual building up uh, of uh, everything that is necessary to uh, describe the overall structure, let's say, uh, that is the universe. Because one of the things that actually that I uh, I parenthetically uh, uh, mentioned to Chris Fields during one of those uh, uh, discussions over at the Active Inference Institute was that I personally consider the, the universe to be a, a closed system. So th that's something that it's a bit uh, uh, a radical view if, if you think about it, because first of all, active in inference mainly focus on open systems that they are dynamical. 
but as I, I as I understand it and as I explained it, uh, it, it was like the universe always expands, but if you somehow were able to play to press pause, you will get like a, a rectangular shape for the for the universe, let's say. Then you can consider that as a closed system. That like it's one, it's one rigid, uh, a huge, let's say, a, a rectangle. And if you uh, press again the play button, it will increase a bit. And then when you pause again and compare the two, you see that it it got expanded a bit. And uh, now I'm 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 taking this back to my own theory with the uh, mm -hmm. and the platonic solids. Let's say in these prisms. Uh, this is what I meant when I said I understand things in a volumetric sense. Like these things expand, and at the end of the day, you can understand it as a as a movie where the the conscious observer gets the chance to perform this type of thought experiment. It's not even a, an actual experiment in this sense, but it is something we can imagine, and then we can slowly, slowly start uh, grasping into what Plato was going on about, about these platonic forms and, and, the, and, the, and the form of beauty, you know, uh, because uh, as they say, the, the, and correct me if I am wrong, the, the supreme good is, is uh, which one of the three? It's the I think it's Ian McGilchrist that uh, say, uh, mentions this. Is the primacy? Uh, I'm not. I'm not oh, uh, D.C. Schindler has a has a <laughs> phrase that he uses, but um, primacy, ultimacy, and um, supremacy. I think, but but. Um, he uses that about each one of the transcendentals, but each one of those words is is as ultimate as you can get, right? So it's kind of irrelevant to me which word goes with which transcendental, because if if the true, I mean, and I'm thinking, I'm not a theologian, but I'm just thinking, if the true, the beautiful, and the good are um, representatives in some sense of God and God is the supreme. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. The scripture says that God is good, but good is an, is a adjective, but uh, the scripture also says God is love and God, God and love are both nouns. So it seems to me that that's more of an equal sign that God equals love and God is good and true and beautiful. So um, truth, beauty, and goodness seem to come out of love. Truth, beauty, and goodness are an expression of love. And so mm -hmm. when, when God expressed his love into the universe, he, he creates a universe that is established to be true, beautiful, and good. Now, I like this thing that you're talking about of the, the reaching out and trying to to find the the edges kind of of the the and you could think of that in terms of the platonic solids or you could think of it in terms of um if if the purpose of my life is to become more and more like Christ then then life becomes every every event in life becomes an opportunity to run these little experiments like i'm going to do this thing and and in hopes that it will bring me somehow closer if that um if i'm obedient in this way maybe i will be palpating palpating more and more towards this ultimate good um i mean just the way that scientists do experiments and then then you have to check and see was that a failure 
did I crash and burn there? You know, so these things happen. We have failures. We stumble, we fall, we have our, our sins and our failures, but we're always trying to move towards that ultimate good. And that's that reaching out and trying to touch, trying to touch, you know, uh, I don't know how to put that into words either. Yeah. Uh, no, this is a great uh, discussion overall. And uh, what you said um, before about about the love, maybe it's it's uh, unconditional love, uh, the love of God, and He is a benevolent God. This is what I understand, <laughs> and uh, He loves us all. Now uh, I I've actually found the uh, that passage from this uh, Schindler. Okay. Uh, for what is worth, I'm gonna. Uh, um, um, read it, the primacy of beauty, the centrality of goodness, and the ultimacy of truth. So above all of them... The primacy of beauty, the centrality, centrality of, of goodness, goodness, and the ultimacy of truth. And the ultimacy of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's uh, one of the, uh, and during uh, and John Vervaghi's uh, lecture, uh, Beyond the beyond Nihilism, he taught us uh, four books. Uh, the last one was uh, uh, that one from, uh, and this is Schindler. Uh, which and which was, book is that from, by the way? Uh, it's the, let me just call you. Let me just find it out. The the book I read of his was Love and the Postmodern Predicament. That one. Oh, okay. Okay. That one, yeah. Well, so do you still we, we don't have that much time left, um, but would you still like to talk a little bit about your your idea regarding entropy? Or maybe just give us a little teaser and then maybe in the future we can talk more about it. Yeah. Uh, just as more comment uh, to conclude uh, the discussion we just had. Okay. Uh, I, I am a strong uh, believer into, uh, into the following. Uh, the more experiments, the merrier. <laughs> so, uh, and, and this goes not only for... Uh, uh, for science, but for all things. And uh, uh, this is, uh, I'm going to be sharing, a, uh, this is a personal story, but for what is worth, I'm going to share it with uh, with you and, and everyone else. Uh, back in 2010, I got the, the great opportunity to visit uh, uh, Turkey and Constantinople, uh, which is a fantastic uh, city, by the way. Uh, that's why they called it the great city. Uh, and uh, I went to Hagia Sophia. And back then it was uh, still operating as a, a museum. Now it's uh, uh, it stopped, they stopped. And uh, anyway, back then it was operating as a museum. So you could uh, go and have a, like a small uh, tour, let's say. And uh, inside, inside the... Uh, Aya Sophia, this uh, great uh, uh, church, there is a, a wishing column. So that it ha it's a column that has a hole in it, and they say that you you insert your thumb in it, and if you feel your thumb getting wet, then your wish will get granted. Okay, so uh, I went there. Uh, I didn't know about this. I found it while I was there. So uh, I went there, I was waiting in line and I, I did my wish. My wish was uh, for God to grant to my father that he was in the hospital back then, seriously uh, ill, uh, many more years. And uh, my wish got granted. My father recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad died. Uh, uh, in 2020, so uh, he gave him another 10 years and 10 years, and 
I was always very, uh, um, how do you say, uh, happy about that. And uh, I'm not saying that uh, uh, this is a, I'm not sharing this story to convert anyone. I'm just saying it as something that personally I, I did. And, I, and I'm talking about uh, my personal experience here. So yeah. Now, uh, going back to uh, Entropy, uh, I got this, uh, I've been working uh, on this notion of, uh, it is a novel notion. Uh, it's something that I call maximum an entanglement. And uh, as Chris Fields uh, mentioned, it can also be called maximum separability. So um, we need this uh, notion. Uh, and now I'm reading uh, what uh, Chris Fields uh, said. Uh, because we need to be able to factor a state space to talk about two different observers. That is to talk about conditional independence. So as I understand conditional this, Conditional independence? Independence, okay. yes. Okay. So as I understand it, and this is my working definition, maximum entanglement or, or maximum separability, separability uh, can be understood as a resource that can be expended to perform classical computation or to increase the coherence of a quantum system. So ju just to uh, uh, analyze a bit what uh, Chris Field uh, uh, meant with his word when when he said we need to be able to factor a state space to talk about two, two different observers. I am tying this back now to my own theory because in my theory I take a surface let's say that is n and uh, I, I I understand it as a pair of primes. Maybe it's a twin pair. Maybe it's a pair of other primes that they are. They have a larger gap, but at the end of the day, it's a rectangular surface that looks like a square. Because uh, if we are talking about a uh, uh, twin prime numbers, then the difference is very small. So we need to be able to factor a state space so to perform factorization in order to talk about two different observers. So in that case. We are talking about. Uh, we are not talking about a single prime number that stands alone, and cannot be broken down any any further. But we are talking about a, a pair of primes that together they form a, a state space, and so we can talk about two different observers. And as the uh, the famous. Uh, examples in, in quantum physics go and cryptography, Alice and Bob. So mm -hmm. you, you have these two because you have actually a boundary uh, and, and, and then you can discuss about classical communi uh, communication or quantum communication and all of that. And uh, just to uh, wrap everything up, uh, in my theoretical and scientific framework, the fundamental blocks of the in this universe they are the prime numbers. So uh, this is uh, uh, let's say informed by those results I got and from my proof with the master group and linking them with twin primality. So it's an interesting new take. Uh, it is computational, but not exactly the same as uh, uh, Wolfram's uh, computational physics. Uh, it, it's something that uh, it, it began from uh, uh, number theory and particularly computational primality, as, as I call it. And it evolved into other fields, including quantum information geometry and quantum information theory. So, Well, that sounds like... Um enough material for another conversation. Does, can we do that? Of course, of course. But we before will. we do that, I want to ask you a dumb question. I love asking you dumb questions because you're so kind. I love them, I love them, I love them. <laughs> I love them, I really um, love them. 
so whenever I think about the um, the numbers like um, <clears throat> pi or Euler's number or any of these that are um, irrational, irrational numbers, yes. Um, are they related to the primes at all? Well, uh, I actually have a, a very recently uh, came up with a with an old approximation of pi that I did, and uh, I didn't. I will share it with you, and we can show it uh, uh, maybe during our next talk. Basically, there is an interesting story behind it. I was looking into some of uh, Ramanujan's uh, work. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I, I came across a formula that he uh, that he made to approximate pi. Okay, and and when you plug some numbers into that formula, for example, when you uh, plug in the number zero in that particular formula, you get an approximation of pi up to five digits and decimal points. Let's say okay, and uh, I found that very intriguing, and I said to myself can I come up with a, a better approximation? And then I, I went uh, and I'll analyze a bit Ramanujan's uh, formula, uh, approximation formula. And I, I, I've noticed that he used in the denominator a prime number, okay? And the square root of two. And I said to myself, if I want to increase the precision, I will flip it. So I, I, will, I will keep the square uh, root on the denominator, but I, I will take the, the prime number uh, on the denominator. And I managed to do it. I did it like in, uh, in two, three hours or so. So I managed to find a, a, a different approximation that uses this format uh, that I told you. And uh, it, it goes up to 11 decimal points. So it uses a, a prime number at the nominator. So I, I, I fully believe that uh, what you say, I even have uh, experience, let's say, to an evidence to support it. So, yeah. And I believe the very same thing can be done with other irrational numbers. So they might be part of your building blocks, in other words. They are, they are like the, uh, as group theory, it's it's so uh, they call it this uh, those groups the 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 building blocks let's say of group theory. In in my version, prime numbers they are the fundamental building blocks of of the whole thing. So you can extract. Uh, uh, okay, this is a, a some uh, uh, sneak peek let's say into uh, the next uh, talk. But one of the of the at least I believe it's it's a it's a good achievement. Let's say uh, I've managed from my framework to uh, recreate the the four kinematic formulas. So uh, out of this volumetric uh, type of thinking and all of that, the work with primes, I actually recreated the four formulas of kinematics from uh, motion uh, of physics, let's say. So I, I feel very happy with that uh, result. And uh, I, as far as I, as I can tell, it can give us great insights into what is taking place because every equation is important in a way uh, because it gives out a, a different uh, perspective. So uh, yeah, that's something. Uh, uh, well, so I, next next time I will share screen so you can show some of your show some yeah. of your work. That would be terrific. So next time we'll talk about your your volumetric theory and uh, and the building blocks of primes. Sounds great. It's been just a delight talking to you, Haris. I feel energized. <laughs> same here. Same here, Berka. Have, have a wonderful weekend. You too, you too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.